Robinson Lilienthal, and I've been involved on and off for about two or three years with uh, the Psychohistory uh, Association. <coughs> um, last year I gave a paper on uh, Isaac Asimov's contribution to Psychohistory. Uh, this year I'm doing one on Nietzsche and Freud as physicians of culture, and then tomorrow afternoon one on the brothers Karamazov. It's like one with a greeting, um, which is actually a continuation of this one this morning. Um, first of all, of course, we should thank all of you for showing up. Next up, I would like to uh, call upon the muse of Cleo, the goddess of history and uh, her psyche. Which is also the name of a magazine that this organization publishes called Cleo Psyche. And of course, Psyche is herself a muse. So we will not sing O Muse of the Wrath of Achilles, but we will sing O Muse of the Wrath of Nietzsche and Freud. Um, I should warn you that I'm probably going to have a lot more to say about Nietzsche than Freud. In part because the idea of Freud as a position of culture is pretty well understood and known, I'm assuming, I mean ideally at least to people in the psychohistory field, uh, that Freud left behind, the, or not left behind, but supplemented his individual therapy and case studies with cultural analysis is a very well known documented phenomenon. Um, his many books on religion and on artists and Michelangelo and uh, 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 theism, Tulsa and Taboo, Future of Illusion, Civilization and Discontents, uh, Group Psychology and so on. I mean, and he, he openly says that you can really not understand an individual without putting it into the family and you can't understand the family unless you put it into the larger social context. So the idea that Freud, a trained physician, could be seen as a physician of culture isn't that novel or, or problematic. The idea, on the other hand, that Friedrich Nietzsche is a physician of culture is a little bit more uh, recherche, and I think very few people have really thought of it in that way. Albeit even Freud has frequently not been read in that context. Um, my starting point is an analysis by Paul Ricoeur in a famous book of his called Freud and Philosophy. The first 30 pages of which are a discussion of hermeneutics, uh, theories of interpretation. And he singles out three great masters of suspicion. Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud. And he, 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 he distinguishes them from earlier philosophical skeptics or, say, Socrates or Descartes in, quite, in, in the fact that they question not only our knowledge of the world, but even our knowledge of consciousness. Descartes seemed to think that our awareness of ourselves as ourselves, the cogito, I think, therefore I am, seem to be the bedrock for Descartes. But with Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud, even consciousness itself is now opaque to itself and needs to be deconstructed. So he calls the, the masters of suspicion, or the hermeneutics of suspicion. And of course, the, the great uh, ontological question there is the contrast between the manifest and the latent what's on the surface versus <clears throat> what's underneath. And of course, as I say, philosophy has always been uh, engaged in this project. Uh, the pre-Socratics took the multiplicity of reality and tried to reduce it to air, earth, fire, or water. We all know, of course, Thales saying that uh, phys, phys, life, 
is reducible to water. Hmm? And then Exomander, and then they introduces Noose and so on. And they're clearly looking for the latent that's beneath the manifest. Now, it's obvious, I think, to all of us that that's true for Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud. Um, only they're doing it not on the metaphysical level, but on the social, psychological analysis level. Again, simplistically, with, with Marx, it's an economic base. We've got the social structure, and we see law, and philosophy, and history, and religion as the manifest. And then we see the economic reality of the exploitation of the workers as the latent. Yeah. So we don't understand any phenomena until we understand its class social economic structure. With Nietzsche, um, in a broad sense, it's uh, the will to power. Uh, the, the, the sort of Darwinian notion that every living organism seeks to preserve itself and to extend its range. And so if you try to understand any social phenomena or any psychological phenomena, you need to get to the latent content, which would be how the, the will to survive and to expand and extend was range of power is is being manifested no matter how it may appear on the surface and of course with Freud we've got the again as a technique now for individual therapy I mean Marx wasn't analyzing individual workers um, Freud of course was analyzing individual patients who came to him as a physician who and they were in pain you don't go to a doctor unless you're in pain. I mean, pain is the signal that something's wrong, and we've all learned from Hippocrates to the present that who do you go to? Not Ghostbusters. <laughs> you, you go to the doctor. Right? <laughs> and many of us um, are, are um, recalcitrant enough not to go to any doctor unless we are in you know, pain. So, I, 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 I had a friend who was a supervisor in, uh, in postgraduate who used to say that for psychotherapists, the latent is the manifest. And what she used to mean by that is that after a few years, um, people that are trained in this field automatically look for the latent. They, they're never bamboozled by the manifest. Um, so the search for truth is always a, a difficult one. We search for it, it's hiding, you know, it's hidden. Who's it hiding from? Is it playing hide and seek? You know, we grapple with it um, or for it. Um, I mean, the whole, all the metaphors that we have for discovering, um, these all involve a kind of degree of suspicion. And it's just that a question of what is suspected and how deep and profound that goes. The very word aletheia for truth in Greek, the A there is a primitive. Lethia means to hide or to cover. And the A is a primitive, just like in the word apocalypse, the A is a primitive. Yeah? So it means revelation, uncovering, discovering. So we need to discover. Yeah? I mean, the premise here is that nothing true is manifest. Now. That's got its own epistemological and ontological problems, but that's the project that Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud seem to give themselves, or that they seem to, to go on. Um, and they're hunters. They're hunters of truth. They're, they're wrestling with it. They're grappling with it. And they're assuming that it's never manifest. They have this in common with detectives. I think one of the reasons that we all love, or many of us love detective stories, is because there is this contrast between the manifest and the latent. Who done it? Well, that's the very phenomenon itself that we're preoccupied with. Who done it means who did it. Hmm? So we want to know who did it. And we're always being deceived by the writer. Yeah? So the least likely suspect is usually the one that did it. Okay, we all know that. We're hip to that one now. 
<laughs> but I mean, why would Agatha Christie be so popular? Why would Sherlock Holmes be known all over the world to this day? Well, they are so, uh, hermeneutics of suspicion. They are masters of the art of suspicion. That's why he's crawling around on the floor with a magnifying glass and memorizing 20 different kinds of cigarette and cigar ashes. So, and law. Yeah, law is involved with that thing too. The, the lawyers and the, and the jury, yeah, the lawyers are each arguing their case. The jury and the judge are assuming that they're not going to get the truth from either of these guys. They're paid to be advocates for their client, the state or an individual. It's the jury's job to finally dig out or discover the latent truth. So my argument is that Nietzsche and Freud and Marx, I mean, I agree with Ricord here, are masters of suspicion. They're physicians of culture. Now, the idea that a philosopher could be a physician uh, from our point of view today in the 21st century is pretty dubious. But I would submit to you that he's still operating on a Hippocratic model, as was the early Freud. I mean, we forget the unbelievable revolution that's taken place in modern medicine, especially with antibiotics and so on now. I mean, so they're still operating with a Hippocratic notion. Furthermore, Nietzsche was a philologist by training, and we know that he studied the writings of Hippocrates. We also know that he himself was bedeviled and dogged by numerous ailments, and in, 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 um, in his own library, he had 15, 20 medical books. He was constantly moving from one place to another to find the perfect, healthy environment. He's constantly experimenting with diets, only vegetables, only meat, or both, or this combination, that combination. And he's constantly traveling with his own little medical bag. And during the Franco-Prussian War, he was trained as a medical orderly. And he did, in fact, serve in that capacity. So the idea that Nietzsche had some kind of a medical training and background is not as preposterous as it appears. Furthermore, as a trained philologist, like many of the great humanists, he is also a master of suspicion to begin with. Because since the early Renaissance, one of the things that the humanists did, starting with Lorenzo Valla already on the donation of Constantine, was to show that certain documents were plagiarized. Well, how do you do that? Well, you find 20 documents that come from the same period, and then you realize that the donation of Constantine uses terms that weren't used then, yeah? that refers to events that hadn't happened yet. So Lorenzo Valla conclusively proves by sheerly linguistic, philological means that the donation of Constantine was a complete forgery made up by the Vatican to give it secular power in the western part of the Roman Empire. Now, eventually he had to recant because they threatened to burn him at the stake, but uh, the book stands. And, uh, so, philology also is part of uh, this hermeneutics of suspicion. <coughs> the underlying <coughs> uh, patron saint of the Hippocratic tradition is, of course, Asclepius. And, and Nietzsche, as a philologist, had done a lot of work on, on the Greeks, as you know, he wrote a book on the birth of tragedy, um, and numerous other short essays that were not published until many years later. <coughs> but what they're looking for are the, are the symptoms, the diagnosis, the prognosis, and the therapy. Now, when I did my own work on Nietzsche about 20 years ago, I, I wrote a dissertation on Nietzsche under, uh, under a woman named Hannah Arendt at the Graduate Faculty of the New School in Hans Helmus. And um, what I did there was, it was called uh, Nietzsche's Anatomy of Nihilism, uh, the Philosopher as Physician of Culture. And in the process of doing that work, I discovered early essays of Nietzsche one of which was called the philosopher's physician of culture. I mean, it couldn't be more, <laughs> more obvious, but it had never been published, 
even in Germany, until Kali and Montaneri pulled it out of the Nietzsche archives in Weimar. And then it was included in their complete um, critical edition, the first complete critical edition ever of Nietzsche's writings. Um, and then <clears throat> I started realizing that his writings from the earliest to the last were just chock-a-block full of medical metaphors. And so it took me a long time, as it often did at the graduate faculty, to get my degree. I think I, I, think I want to, uh, some people put a bet down on me that I would never get my doctorate, <laughs> but they lost. <laughs> I maintained status every semester. I was working, I was married, blah, 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 so I, but I maintained status and I kept working on it. And every time I read Nietzsche in the margin, when there was a medical metaphor, I put MM. Pretty soon, one day I didn't have anything to do, so I started collating them hmm? by terms, both in German and English, and chronologically. And they became the appendix for my dissertation. And once you see that, the, the argument is over. There's no way anybody could dispute that Nietzsche used a medical metaphor. Now, did he do it well? Was it useful? Did he mean it metaphorically? That we can discuss. But that, but that he deployed a medical metaphor is, is I think, uh, beyond dispute. Um, now, why would he do that? I mean, that's really the question. And it struck me that if I go back and look at the Hippocratic writings, um, I might get an answer. So I went back and, and pulled, pulled out the library and then it's a strand, the Loeb series, uh, you know, it's got the Greek on one side and the English on the other. And then I read a whole bunch of stuff about the Hippocratics and ancient Greek medicine and so on and so forth. And lo and behold, one of the things I discovered was that the Greeks uh, saw medicine as the first purely naturalistic science that they had created for the first time anywhere probably in the world Human beings were looking for a naturalistic cause for a disease instead of looking for a god or some spirit or some taboo that you had broken. Yeah? And instead of going to uh, a ritual of, um, you know, uh, kachina dolls or dancing or something, you, you went to uh, the island of Kos, which became like uh, the hospital of the ancient Hellenistic world. Um, one of the most frequently found temples in the entire Greco-Roman world were the temples to Asclepius. And they would create a new one by bringing the snakes of Asclepius with them. And of course you all know the Caduceus. Well, that's a big mistake. I mean, it wasn't, didn't have anything to do with Hermes. Uh, the Caduceus is a Herm Hermes thing, the trickster. Uh, the staff of Asclepius had a snake going on. It was a plain snake, it wasn't poisonous. And uh, they fed it, uh, they would feed it uh, mice. And so in all the uh, Asclepia places that they would have uh, snakes and mice. And his other patron animal was, of course, the, the dog. And um, we can immediately see the metaphorical point of that. Interestingly enough, one of the things you did when you went to one of these temples was you would tell the, the, the local priest or, you know, or physician what your problems were and then you would sleep overnight. You would sleep overnight and you would um, tell your dreams to the priest physician in the morning and he would use those to help figure out a diagnosis. What's that say? Five minutes remaining. Five minutes remaining. I thought I had till 10, 20, 10, 25. Right, but we, we, no, we leave at least 15 minutes of discussion time, so that's, right, okay. Well, then obviously I'm not going to finish. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, do, you know, I, I, I thought I had until 10, 25, but that's what it says in the oh, schedule. Oh, right, but we, we sent the message to all presenters. Uh, do the best you can, okay? Yeah, yeah I will. Um, <clears throat> given these in the past has been five minutes, and yesterday the papers I said were about five minutes worth. Um, I certainly thought I had more than five minutes.
So, um, the illness that Nietzsche is, is diagnosing or giving the symptoms of um, is nihilism, which on the popular level would be called the death of God. Um, now, Nietzsche doesn't think that, he's not claiming a metaphysical statement, he's, he's claiming a psychological, cultural one. And the point there is that there was a time when God was efficacious, when we did believe in him. So in that sense, he was alive. But Nietzsche's claim is more than just that God died, it's that God was murdered. And in case science 125, um, that's really the burden of, of what he says, as well as it does folks there at Um In a way, Nietzsche, I think, was a better historian than Freud was. Freud really did not look. He looked at the anthropology of religion, but he did not look at the history of the, of the decline of the, of the belief in God, or as Nietzsche, as a philologist and historian, did. And as I say, he, he, he analyzes this process, biblical criticism being part of it, uh, the humanist revolution and the Renaissance being another part, and of course Darwin. And Darwin would be sort of the background for all three of these hermeneutics of suspicion. Um, the, the symptoms of, of nihilism are, I think, really pretty well understood in the sense that I think we've, we all have been living in a, in a God is dead uh, world. Uh, I think the uh, exception, of course, would be certain Muslim countries. But I think even there, one could see their their uh, actions as, as a reactive. Um, now, obviously Nietzsche did not literally believe in God having died or been murdered. He's talking about a cultural event. So, he really has three stages of, of this. And the first is religious nihilism. Those are the people who claim to believe in a religion, but of course there is nothing. So they're literally believers in nothing, but they don't know that. Their underlying position is that of, of weakness, usually, of resentment. And these individuals then are, by their need to figure out what's going on, they posit a true world. Now, as that true world starts to collapse with the rise of modern science and, and so on, um, we move to what Nietzsche would call radical nihilism and then completed nihilism. So these would be the three basic stages. Um, the healthy culture that he would contrast this with would be the ancient Greeks, um, who he doesn't think um, had to posit this, this true world. Um, he refers to Christianity as Platonic Christianity, and in many ways, if you end up, I mean, if you try to think of what a recipe for, for Christianity would be, um, it certainly would be something that would include a good deal of, 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 of Greek philosophy, certainly Platonism. Um, under radical nihilism, there would be three subcategories. One would be the indifferent radical nihilists who really don't care. The people in the marketplace who make fun of the madman. There would be the passive radical nihilists, like the last pope, who watches God die, but doesn't feel any involvement with it. And then there would be the active radical nihilists who, <coughs> like the, the, the ugliest man, who personally believes that he murdered God. And part of what all three of them have in common is a distorted view of temporality. <clears throat> the passive radical nihilist lives in the past. They are the, the church, various kinds of institutions, <clears throat> who valorize the past and who really don't have room for the present or the future. Uh, they're stuck in their stereotypes. The indifferent radical nihilist is trying to live in the present. 
that's one of those, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we may die. And the problem there is that they're disconnected from their past, they're rootless, and they don't really see a meaningful future. The active radical nihilist, on the other hand, is somebody who lives only for the future. They are prepared to destroy the present and the past for the sake of the future. And since Nietzsche and Freud, we have of course seen in the case of the Nazis and the Soviet Union, the extent to which people are willing to go to sacrifice the present and the past for the future. The challenge <coughs> that the nihilist has, the, the radical nihilist, as the transcendence is collapsing, is to try to figure out a way to reconnect these three temporalities. And, and part of what Nietzsche's argument seems to be in Zarathustra is that um, although Nietzsche would say that God died and was in fact murdered, he would say that not one person murdered God, but that the culture collectively murdered God. And maybe the best way to get that notion across is to compare it to an Agatha Christie novel called Murder on the Orient Express, where Hercule Perot at the end discovers that all the suspects are guilty. Yeah. This guy had abducted a Lindbergh-like child, and the retainers and <coughs> nannies and family and friends of, the, of this abducted child tracked down the kidnapper and the murderer of that child and he happens to be on the Orient Express. And one by one that night, they go in and they plunge their dagger into the victim. Or, you know, and this is a form of revenge that they see themselves as partaking in. So there isn't any one murderer. It's a ritual. And what Nietzsche seems to be arguing at the end of Zarathustra is that in order to turn an event into a meaningful one that opens us to the future, we need to make a ritual out of it. Ritual seems to have the ability <coughs> to heal time, to knit time together. Have you not heard of the madman who lit a lantern in the bright morning hours, ran to the marketplace and cried incessantly, I see God, I see God. As many of those who did not believe in God were standing around just then, he provoked much laughter. Has he got lost, asked one, did he lose his way like a child, asked another, or is he hiding? Is he afraid of us, has he gone on a voyage, immigrated? Thus they yelled and laughed. The madman drunk jumped into their midst and pierced them with his eyes. Whither is God, he cried, I will tell you, we have killed him. You and I, all of us are his murderers. But how did we do this? How could we drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What were we doing when we unchained this earth from its sun? Whither are we moving? Whither, uh, away from all suns, are we not plunging continually, backward, sideward, forward, in all directions? Is there still in the up or down? Are we not straying as through an infinite nothing? Do we not feel the breath of empty space? Has it not become colder? Is not night continually closing in on us? Do we not need to light lanterns in the morning? Do we hear nothing as yet of the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? Do we smell nothing as yet of the divine decomposition? God's too decomposed. God is dead, God remains dead. 
and we have killed him. How shall we comfort ourselves? The murderers of all murderers. What was holiest and mightiest of all that the world has yet owned has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe this blood off us? What water is there for us to clean ourselves? What festivals of atonement? Yeah, that's the ritual. What sacred games shall we have to invent? Is not the greatness of this deed too great for us? Must we ourselves not become gods simply to be worthy of it? There has never been a greater deed, and whoever is born after us for the sake of this deed, he will belong to a higher history than all history hitherto. Here the madman fell silent and looked again at his listeners, and they too were silent and stared at him in astonishment. At last he threw his lantern on the ground, and it broke into pieces and went out. I have come too early, he said. My time is not yet. This tremendous event is still on its way, still wandering. It has not yet reached the ears of men. Lightning and thunder require time. The light of the stars requires time. Deeds, though done, still require time to be seen and heard. This deed is still more distant from them than the most distant stars. And yet, they have done it themselves. It has been related further that on the same day the madman forced his way into several churches and there struck, out, struck up his requiem a turn of Dale. Let out and called to account, he is said always to have replied nothing but, what after all are these churches now if they are not the tombs and sepulchres of God? Okay. Whoa.